Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, my name is Daniela Flieser. I'm a nephrologist from Homburg, Germany, and currently also the Renal Science Chair of the European Renal Association. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for this kind invitation to give a lecture at this prestigious national meeting of the Indian Society of Nephrology. Unfortunately, I was not able to join you in persona due to the circumstances related to the COVID-19 pandemic. I was also not able to give this talk in live stream because right now I'm sitting in the airplane to Italy to join my fellows at the ERA Council meeting. Saying that, I would like also to extend my warm greetings on behalf of my ERA Council fellows to the Indian colleagues. Let me now share the screen with you. I was asked to give a talk on precision medicine in the diagnosis and treatment of kidney disease. I will, however, not focus on specific kidney diseases like glomerulonephritis. Rather than that, I will focus on something which seems much more trivial, that is the assessment of progressive chronic kidney disease. My talk will be divided in three parts. The first of all, we will be dealing with the problem of the proper diagnosis and prediction of CKD progression. The second part will deal with molecular biology in kidney disease to reveal important pathways of CKD progression. And here specifically, I will talk about the wind beta catenin pathway. Finally, I will review some of our recently published data on a very new biomarker for progressive kidney disease, DKK3 in urine, and its utility also for clinical management of patients. Let me start here with the talk of a former president of the United States, Barack Obama, at his talk at the State of the Union address. There, he actually officially launched a precision medicine initiative. And the baseline of this precision medicine initiative was that disease prevention and treatment strategies should take individual variability into account. When coming to kidney diseases, we use for this purpose the so-called Kedigo heat map, which is displayed here, and I'm very sure that you are all familiar with it. This so-called Kedigo heat map classifies patients with kidney diseases according to the underlying cause of kidney disease, to their glomerular filtration rate and albuminuria in several categories, also for risk prediction of progressive kidney diseases. Green means low risk, red means very high risk for disease progression. However, individual progression of patients is not taken in, in, into account by this heat map because the individual CKD progression might be very variable and depends on the underlying cause of chronic kidney disease presence of comorbidities or intercurrent diseases like high blood pressure or concomitant treatment. I would like to explain you using these data from a very large study from the so-called CKD Prognosis Consortium. Here we have data from 35 cohorts on about 1.7 million subjects and during an observation time of 10 years, more than 12,000 subjects reached end-stage kidney disease necessitating renal replacement treatment. These data were the basis for this Kedigo heat map. And what you can see here, I will explain this complicated table to you. First of all, 
Let us start, for example, with a category of patients having a glomerular filtration rate at baseline of 35 milliliters per minute. So they are in the CKD stage three. If in these patients, the glomerular filtration rate declines in the next two years, according to a 50% decline, that is doubling of serum creatinine, then during the year after, roughly about 20% of these persons reach terminal renal failure. And after 10 years, all of them are in end-stage kidney disease. However, if we remain in this category and going on the other side of the table, you will realize that if kidney function remains stable two years after the baseline investigation, then only one out of 100 patients will reach terminal renal failure within one year, and within 10 years, not more than 20%. So even within this CKD category, progression is extremely variable. And this is pointed out nicely by Harlan Himmelfarb in a recent review, where they illustrated the, the clinical heterogeneity of CKD progression. They have shown four hypothetical CKD cases, as you can see here. And all these four cases share the same CKD classification according to their GFR. Nevertheless, we will all know that the prognosis of these four differ widely. And also the treatment approach for them differ widely. And even if we have a more homogeneous cohort, as shown on the next slide here, there is huge variation in CKD progression. These are recently published data from the CKD DOPS study. CKD DOPS is a large international observational study that is done in the United States, Brazil, France, Germany, and also Japan. And what you see here actually are only patients from Germany in CKD stage three and four. And roughly two thirds of them had diabetes and hypertension as the primary cause of chronic kidney disease. And yes, you can see here, the glomerular filtration was about 40 in stage three and the uh, median glomerular filtration was 30, 23 in stage four. And let us have now a look on the patients with a GFR at the baseline below 30 milliliters per minute, more than 1,100 patients in this CKD stage four, they were followed for three years. And what you can see here in the colors is their progression rate or the loss of GFR during these three years. And you will clearly see that only 40% had a progression rate above two milliliters per year, whereas 60% had no progression at all, despite being already in CKD, CKD stage four. This shows us how variable progression is. And this is depicted here on a slide, a very simple cartoon showing us how progression is going on in our patients. With kidney disease or insult, you can have almost no progression if it's a rather benign disease or slow progression or modest progression or even very fast progression. We define this as a loss of GFR of more than five milliliters per minute per year. The problem is, progression is much more variable individually, and it can go like that. So the GFR patterns are not linear at any time. And if you put two time points here, you can see that progression at the first and the second time point, even in the individual patients, can vary tremendously. 
So next example of this variable progression is depicted here. A recent study published in JAMA, again by the CKD Prognosis Consortium, this time in more than 5 million subjects from 34 cohorts, and they calculated the risk of getting incident chronic kidney disease in these patients or persons, that is to drop below an EGFR of 60 milliliters per minute within an observational period of five years. And all these data were validated in nine additional cohorts comprising more than 2 million subjects. And actually, what I have done is a kind of kidney risk equation, which you probably know they are in several forms, and they are taking into account modifiable and non-modifiable clinical and also laboratory data. And also in this study, they had a lot of modifiable and not modifiable um, uh, var variables taken into account for calculating the progression risk. What I have found, focus please first on the left part of this cartoon. These are subjects with 25 years of age. And as you can see, either they have no albuminuria at all, or they have large or gross albuminuria. And even in these young patients, the risk of having incident CKD varies from zero to 20%. And if you go on the right hand side of this cartoon, you see the elderly patients or subjects. And in those without albuminuria, risk varies between 10 and 30%. And in those with large albuminuria, between 30 and even 60%. So there is a huge variability. And it is a little bit problematical for clinical work because you can't say to your patient, your risk to have progressive kidney disease is somewhere between 30 and 60%, because the patients will immediately ask you, well, am I in the group which has the 30% risk of progression or in the group which has a 30, 70% um, uh, of no risk of progression? And even in this elderly group, you can see that probably the group without albuminuria could be a group of normal aging because we know that after the age of 50 years, glomerular filtration rate is slowly declining. So this could be simply normal aging and not progressive kidney disease. So taking together, prediction of CKD progression is very difficult. As pointed out by Niels Bohr, a Danish Nobel Prize winner for physics, prediction is very difficult, particularly if it's about the future. So how can we help us? We can use precision medicine, which was defined in nephrology by Wyatt and Schlöndorf in a recent editorial in Kidney International. And they pointed out that the goal of precision medicine is to characterize the disease based on the underlying molecular biology in order to identify specific biomarkers and therapeutic targets. And I will go now into the second part of my presentation, asking what would be the ideal biomarker for progressive kidney disease? To my opinion, first of all, it should be highly sensitive for detection of any kind of kidney tissue injury at any time. That means that at any time you observe your patient or you manage your patient, such a biomarker should identify progression or active disease or non-active disease. Secondly, it should be completely non-specific. That means completely independent of the cause of the injury to the kidneys. So it doesn't matter if it is diabetes or blood pressure or some nephrotoxic drugs. At the end, what counts is progression of kidney disease. And this would be another part of my presentation. It should be a relevant therapeutic target, at least as a biomarker. Let me then start 
with a very important pathway in kidney injury. That is the so-called wind beta catenin pathway. It is a evolutionary conserved, highly complex pathway, which is very important during embryogenesis. In adulthood, it is usually suppressed in almost all our organs, but can be reactivated in tissue and organ injury, and also can promote regeneration to some extent. This pathway is active then almost in all organs, and there are data from several organs which showed that this pathway is active during injury. And importantly, there are numerous studies in a variety of kidney injuries, acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease, which due to the shortage of time, I cannot review in detail. However, we know when renal tubular cells, and I will now focus on renal tubular cells, um, are injured, this pathway can be activated. And a transient activation of this pathway can even exert regeneration. However, a prolonged un uncontrolled activation ends in progressive kidney disease due to a change in the phenotype of tubular epithelial cells that are driving then tubular interstitial fibrosis as you can see here. And very importantly, this pathway is connected also to other pathways as the Rene angiotensin system. Or for example, a modulator of this pathway is sclerostin, which is a known therapeutic target also in bone disease. And important modulators of this pathway are the so-called Dikov proteins. They serve as ligands, modulators, of these wind beta catenin signaling pathways. Four of these proteins exist, just four. And the role of DKK1 and 2 has been recently heavily investigated in cancer biology. Where comes the name from? Dikopf. Dikopf is German and means big hat because in Heidelberg at the uh, German Cancer Center, these pathway and these proteins were actually found. And if you knock out DICOP1 during embryogenesis, then such African frogs develop, develop very big heads and multiple eyes, as you can see. So therefore comes the name DICOP. And we have shown that DKK3 or DICOP3 is an important modulator of this pathway, particularly during kidney injury. We have published this uh, data from two experimental models of progressive chronic kidney disease, unilateral ureter obstruction and the adenine diet model. And what we have shown here, as you can see, that tissue fibrosis or tubular interstitial fibrosis can be dramatically reduced in these animal models by antibody blockade of DKK3 or even knockout, so genetical knockout of DKK3. This dramatically prevents tubular interstitial fibrosis in these models and of course prevents the decline of kidney function. Taking together all our animal experiments, we could show that DKK3 actually is a stress-induced tubular cell-derived profibrotic uh, protein that is secreted in the urine by tubular cells and kidney injury. It's like a kidney troponin. Importantly, it is not specific, completely unspecific. So no matter what injures the kidney, DKK3 is produced and secreted. And it can be measured in urine using a simple ELISA. And we have shown that healthy subjects do not have detectable DKK3 in urine at all. Whereas CKD patients, irrespective of the type of kidney injury, have DKK3 in urine, and it correlates with CKD progression. As you can see here, 
uh, nice staining of DKK3 in the kidney, particularly in tubules, whereas the glomerulin is completely free of DKK3. It is only expressed in tubular cells. These are these white colored tubular cells. And in the last three, four years, numerous clinical studies have been published by our and other groups on the utility of DKK3 as a progression marker. I will review some of them. The first study from our group was published three years ago in Jason, where we have measured uh, DKK3 in urine in a general population from our town, that's the I like home, population and we can we could show that in these healthy individuals none or only very small amounts of dkk3 were detectable in urine the blue box please note that this is a logarithmic scale here so the median was 33 picograms this is 1000 times less than the albumin concentration in urine and the ckd patients you can see here from our CKD care for home cohort had 13 times higher, higher DKK3 levels in urine. And the levels were independent from the cause of kidney injury. What we have done next, we have done, we have studied these 50, 75 patients with CKD stage two to four and a defined cause of kidney disease mostly diabetes or hypertension for eight years. The follow-up now is much longer, but at that time it was eight years. And we had annual visits with blood and urine samples. So in total, we had 2000 person years available for analysis. We have measured urinary DKK3 at each time point and correlated it with a change of GFR during the next year. And doing that, we could as, um, make a statistical association between the urinary DKK3 concentration and the annual changes of GFR shown on this plot. The red line indicates the estimated GFR. The blue spikes down here are the individual urinary DKK3 concentrations. And as you can see, if you have very low levels of DKK3 or not measurable, there is no change of GFR at all during the next year, even if you have a defined kidney disease. But if you have very high levels, more than 1,000 or even more than 4,000, the progression of chronic kidney disease is accelerated to more as you can see, to of 5% or even 10% per year. So DKK3 clearly shows you or indicates you the progression of a chronic kidney disease irrespective of the cause in the next 12 months here. And importantly, this was completely independent of the albuminuria status also in patients without any albuminuria, as you can see, below 30 milligrams per gram uh, creatinine, DKK3 was significantly associated with progressive GFR loss. Importantly, we have validated our results in a non-CKD cohort to show that DKK3 is also able to detect incipient chronic kidney disease. This time, and this is very recently published in Kidney International, we have studied more than 2,300 patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We know that there is a crosstalk between the organs like heart and kidney, but also the lungs and the kidney. The follow-up was 18 months, and we have divided these patients or subjects according to DKK3 below and above 200. Please remember 200 was the limit where you have absolutely no progression when it is below 200 in CKD patients. And what you can see at the first glance down here, the serum creatinine concentration was completely similar, similar between these two groups, as well as was the GFR, which was almost normal in these patients. However, there was a large difference in urinary DKK3 levels. 
And looking on the progression within eight months, we can clearly show that high urinary DKK3 levels above 200 picograms per milligram were significantly associated with progression in these patients, but not baseline GFR, not or nor proteinuria. And even more importantly for us nephrologists, we have studied only subjects with a GFR above 90 milliliters per minute and absolutely no albuminuria from this cohort and could show that DKK3 was able to predict a loss of more of 10% or 15% or 20% of GFR in the next 18 months. This was not possible with the baseline GFR nor with albuminuria. Coming to another important issue for us, this is the AKCKD transition. And here we have published two years ago a study in Lancet, the HTC study, also from Homburg. It was a prospective study in more than 700 consecutive patients undergoing elective cardiac surgery. We know that elective cardiac surgery is associated with high risk of AK up to 20, 30%. And therefore, we assessed in this cohort the progression or the uh, chronic kidney disease progression after AKI. Importantly, also in these patients, sorry, the mean GFR was almost normal, 89 milliliter per minute. And we assessed DKK3 in urine before surgery. So it was not used for diagnosis for AKI, but to predict AKI and AKI transition. And this first slide shows you the association between urinary DKK3, again here is blue spikes, and the probability of getting acute kidney injury. And the higher the levels of DKK3 in urine, the higher the risk for AKI, up to 400%. Here, hazard ratio was four times higher in patients with high DKK levels. And even more important for us, DKK3 levels could group patients according to their progression after acute kidney injury. As you can see here, group A with low or not measurable DKK3 levels was the group with no AK and no loss of kidney function after the surgical operation uh, during a follow-up of almost three years. Group B with high DKK3, DKK3 levels had a moderate loss of GFR of the AK and CKD progression. And worst was group C with very high DKK3 levels where the patients had a severe loss of GFR after acute kidney injury. So clearly DKK3 is able to predict AK CKD transition. And this was recently also confirmed by an Italian group with contrast media. How they have, in contrast to us, studied almost 460 patients with a GFR already below 30 milliliters per minute, undergoing invasive cardiovascular procedures requiring contrast media administration. They have assessed, of course, eGFR before and 30 days after application of contrast media, and they have measured various biomarkers before the contrast media application and defined persistent kidney dysfunction as a reduction of more than 25% of EGFR after contrast media application. And here are the results. 12% of patients developed a kidney persistent kidney dysfunction after contrast media application. And as you can see, Urinary DKK3 was the best indicator of acute kidney injury, much better even than cystatin C, NGAL, and so on. And even above that, adding baseline urinary DKK3 to several formulas or uh, clinical scores significantly increased their discrimination power. So this was highly statistically significant. So that also in this population, DKK3 was able to predict AK and AKCKD transition. And another very recent study published in NDT, a smaller one on 66 patients, 
but very actual. You see here, these were patients with severe acute COVID-19 infection. And also these colleagues measured several markers, not only albumin or uh, DKK3, but several other markers. I'm just showing uh, representatively the results on DKK3 and albumin. And as you can see, those patients who progressed with their kidney injury after six months after the acute kidney injury due to COVID were those with steadily high urinary DKK3 levels, whereas albuminuria decreased and did not indicate progression of CKD. But however, on contrast, urinary DKK3 was able to uh, predict this progressive chronic kidney disease after COVID-19 infection. Let me now talk shortly about the second part of the use of an ideal biomarker. For now, I have shown you that DKK3 is highly sensitive for detection of kidney injury of any cause, any time. Now, turn, let us turn to the use of DKK3 as a potential therapeutic biomarker. I will start with the discussion of a recently published uh, study, which was very well accepted in the nephrology community with SGL2 inhibitors and CKD progression. You are all aware of this data. You have probably seen it numerous times, data from the DAPA CKD study. Here, patients with and without diabetes mellitus were included if they had a GFR above 25 and below 75 milliliters per minute and a higher grade albuminuria. Why I'm showing you these results? The composite primary endpoint was a usual endpoint sustained GFR decline of more than 50% or terminal kidney failure. And these are the primary results which were provocative because highly significant reduction of the relative risk, almost 40% with DAPA treatment compared to placebo. And the number to treat it needed to treat was only 19. But what actually means these numbers, if you go into more details, it means that if you look very carefully, only 11.8% of patients from this very large cohort during an observation time of 32 months had, a term, had an endpoint, had reached an endpoint. And 88% did not, but they were still treated. And even in those patients who reached an endpoint, 4.6 were in the placebo group and 7.2 it's, it's, sorry, 4.6 were in the DAPA group and 7.2 were in the placebo group. That means that the relative risk reduction was between this absolute risk reduction from 7 to 4.6%. This means that there is a substan substantial remaining risk and we have to identify those patients with this remaining risk. And we have to identify those patients reaching endpoints because the other ones are treated with having no endpoints, but possible adverse events. And we have now studied a trial which was already published more than 10 years ago in the New England Journal, the so-called ESCAPE trial. In this trial, almost 400 children with chronic kidney disease and an EGFR between 15 and 80 milliliters per minute were studied. They had a six month run in phase with supportive therapy that was RAS blocker. So and these children were treated like the patients in the DAPA CKD study. And they were randomized thereafter after this run in phase to conventional blood pressure control or intensified blood pressure control. And the primary endpoint was similar as in the DAPA CKD trial. And we had available 230 baseline urines in both treatment groups. And we have analyzed DKK3, of course, 
and could show first this. We have divided the group of children with respect to the median DKK3 this time, because in this group of children were quite fastly progressive. And importantly, children did not have diabetes. So no confounding by diabetes, had very low hypertension. So no, almost no confounding by hypertension or smoking in such factor. One could say this is sterile CKD. And you can see at the first glance, the difference between the low and the high DKK3 group. In the low group, DKK3 was, the, the median was only 160, again, below 200. And in the high, DKK3 group, it was almost 9,000, so a huge difference. There was no significant difference between albuminuria. This is due to the uh, primary kidney disease. You can see these are primarily uh, interstitial kidney diseases, but there was already a difference in GFR. And these are the results on the treatment. And first, I have to point out that we have adjusted for all confounding factors, including baseline albuminuria in GFR. And there, secondly, was a significant interaction between urinary DKK3 and randomization group, means that DKK3 shows you an important result according to randomization. And that is that only those children with high DKK3 levels had a benefit from blood pressure reduction and not those with low levels. And this is shown on the next slide. On the left-hand side are the children with, uh, with DKK3 levels below median. It was about 160 picogram per milligram. And as you can see, they almost had no endpoints even after seven years of observation period. And there was no effect of intensified blood pressure lowering. So whatever you do in these children, they don't have progression. And the completely opposite picture was in children with high DKK3 level. After seven years of observation period, uh, you see here those uh, with standard treatment or standard blood pressure lowering, almost all reached an endpoint, an renal endpoint. Whereas, as you can see, those treated more intensively had a 40% chance of, of not having an renal endpoint. So clearly, UKK, uh, DKK3 in urine shows you whom to treat. So I'm at the end of my talk. And I would like to summarize that diagnosis and monitoring of progressive chronic kidney disease is difficult in everyday practice, since the individual course of chronic kidney disease can be highly variable, as we have seen. A new biomarker, DKK3, a tubular stress biomarker, can identify patients at high risk for CKD progression as well as achy CKD transition. It is a kind of kidney troponin. And possibly using also this biomarker, we can make um, individualized biomarker treatments in our patients uh, using it as precision medicine approach. Thank you very much for your attention.